Session 9, Security Breach. The Diamond Dogs temporarily part ways, with Rack heading to the Crimson Coliseum. It takes him a while, but once he arrives, he asks for an audience with the halfling woman he had met earlier that evening, Celine Le Duc, and inquires what she knows of him, as she has information on all of the party members. The information I have on you is less than everyone else, unfortunately. Rick, a half-orc with no home, knows not where he comes from, nor does anyone, save for the one who made him. Dangerous, yet innocent. Unfortunately, that is all I can tell you. For that is all my employer told me. I hope you understand. Have a good night. Rek then departs, learning that he was made, not born. Meanwhile, Mardigan heads to a dive bar, and after just a couple of drinks, cannot clear his head of what Eros has said of him. So just steal something. You're all though. talk, Mardigan. Putting his drink down, he stands up, pays his tab, and heads into the night, until passing by a house that screams wealth and power to Mardigan. And it's not long until he finds himself climbing over the wall and entering the house silently. He discovers the house belongs to one Thomas Leblanc, who is in fact a paid employee of Lanfany. In his second floor study, he finds a note. Monsieur Leblanc, please find everything you will need for the delivery for my associate. As per our agreement, you must ensure she receives these items post haste and has all the person needs in order to complete her assignment. Do not fail me again, Thomas, lest you find yourself paying the consequences. It would be a terrible shame for your family to lose their chief breadwinner. Warmest wishes and regards, Arimet de Kimer. Inside of a locked safe, Mardigan finds many items. A pouch with platinum coins, a platinum ring with an inlaid garnet, a five pound bar of gold, a sealed scroll, a candle, a needle, and a vial of clear liquid. He takes everything except for the letter from Lady Arimet and the candle, and decides it's time to head back. Meanwhile, back at the care of the coast, Fenwick and Eros have decided to grab a drink. And Eros asks Fenwick, if you could describe Mardigan with one word, what do you think it would be? Fenwick, not exactly sure on how to respond, allows Eros to answer his own question. For me, I think Mardigan's desperate. And at that moment, Merle Vare makes his way over to them. Well, Eros, just uh, wanted to let you know. A pretty little thing stopped by and said she missed your performance earlier. She was a secret admirer and paid for a drink for you. This is for you. And Merle places a pint of ale in front of Eros. Actually, that's uh, her there, he says as he looks over. And Eros and Fenwick both look over and note this secret admirer. Her back is turned to them, but her red hair is as brilliant as Mithran himself, the sun god, and another of the principal deities. Eros, rather uninterested, decides to leave the drink and continues talking to Fenwick, until eventually both Rek and Mardigan make their return to the care of the Coast Inn. They all decide to retire for the evening, but Mardigan makes for the roof once more, this time, unfortunately, falling, and making quite the racket, waking both Kethed and Eros, who go to the window to see what the ruckus is all about. Eros calls down, You okay? Mardigan, not saying anything, stands up and continues to walk off, and Eros says, Oh, please, just come and talk to us, okay? Mardigan stops, turns his head, and says, I'll be in the bar, and true to his word, ends up sitting at a table, grabbing a pint for himself. Both Eros and Kethid make their way down to the bar to have a discussion with Mardigan, and Eros sings him a song of rest, making Mardigan uncomfortable. But every time Mardigan's eyes break contact with Eros, he stops, calls attention to it, and starts over, until eventually Mardigan lets him finish his song. Feeling much better, whatever wounds he might have sustained during his fall, they decide it's time for bed. But as they are making their way up to the stairs, Murrow clutches his chest, coughs violently, and hurls backwards, smashing into the glass case behind the bar and falling to the floor. Kethid and Mardigan run over to Murrow while Eros scans the bar and notes that the red-haired woman is fleeing into the night. He follows after and notes that she is leaving the bar and running quickly down the street. He then turns and makes his way upstairs to the room of both Fenwick and Rek, pounding on the door. Fenwick! Fenwick! You have to wake up! Fenwick comes to the door, and after a brief explanation of what has happened, summons his familiar, who is immediately sent to find the red-haired woman and follow her through the streets. It is not long before he does so, and as she turns the corner and runs down another part of the street, she eventually stops, and things get weirder. Her form changes, her red hair changing dirty blonde, and shoulder length instead of the waist length it had been. She stops and calls the attention of the crowd around her, and it is at the sound of her voice that Fenwick recognizes he knows this individual from somewhere. 
the last time he saw her, wearing a wedding dress and a snapped left-heeled shoe, throwing a ring into the center of a tavern. Please, she calls out. Something's happened to Merle over at Care of the Coast. I think he's dead, poisoned most likely. And there were individuals who had been staying there per his request. I think one of them might have done it. Please, someone call the authorities. And a crowd begins to make their way to the Care of the Coast. Fenwick, using Isa's eyes as his own, relays all of this to Eros, and they realize they must leave. Meanwhile, back downstairs, while all of this is taking place, Ketha determines that Merle is dead. He died very quickly, he said. Poisoned, Mardigan replies. Mardigan notes the time of evening and says, I bet these were midnight tears, an incredibly expensive and lethal poison. I wonder who it was for. And the two of them decide to make their way back upstairs, grabbing their things alongside the others. And it is then that the Diamond Dogs flee for Brambrox, after Fenwick relays to the group that he has recognized this would-be assassin as none other than Victoria, Eris's ex fiance they split up into two groups, Mardigan leading Kethed and Wreck through the back streets and shadows as quickly and quietly as he can, whereas Fenwick and Eros, who decides to cast Disguise Self on his person, decide to take main streets and blend in with the crowds. The two groups arrive at a similar time in front of Brambrock III's and rap on his door as quickly, quietly, and efficiently as they can. Eventually, Brambrock III does indeed come and answer the door, and they inform him of what has happened. Brambrock, taken aback and mournful at the loss of Merle, asks the group to tell him as little as possible, his request for plausible deniability, as he knows that whatever this attempt was, likely is beyond his ability to handle, or his influence to pull any kind of favor with Carisian law enforcers. He then informs the group that they may indeed stay there that evening, that he had planned on them coming and joining him on the Eve of Lights anyway, and that they may stay as long as they need to, until the ship leaves on the 22nd, which is now likely their only way out of the city safely. The group processes everything that has happened, and eventually fall asleep. Mardigan wakes early that morning, and appraises his hall, but much to his surprise, one of the greater discoveries is that a flower seems to be forming in Eros's hand, a marigold of similar color, patterns, and pulsating crimson, as the one that Eros had smelled and been gifted to from the Dryad several days prior. As the rest of the group wakes up and also notes this, Fenwick asks if he may smell the flower. He does so, and is reminded of his childhood time at Brunelorth's, sitting in the Great Hall, feasting, drinking, and looks up to see the eyes, face, and form of his young love, Adelie, and his flame-haired friend, a fire ganassi by the name of Marco Glacius, who ended up focusing his studies and efforts on evocation and destruction magics. Eventually, Fenwick does come to his senses, and the group tries to make some sort of plan for the day ahead. Mardigan decides to head to the Headless Hippogriff, and there purchases the expensive bottle of bourbon that Fenwick had mentioned the night prior, using the coin that he had lifted from Thomas Leblanc. During that time, Fenwick and Kethed head for Golden Shore Academy, another arcane institute and rival of Brunelorth's, where Fenwick is an adjunct professor. It is here that they meet Eloise Calon, another adjunct professor, one who teaches rudimentary transmutation to the students at the Golden Shore Academy. Pleasantries are exchanged, and Fenwick and Eloise exchange mutual respect for each other, the two schools appreciating the differences and focuses of the different arcane schools and the students that would study them. Fenwick asks about a Professor Valtor, an illusion professor, there at Golden Shore, that he wishes to see, an old acquaintance, and Eloise decides to give them a tour. She even agrees to take them to Valtor's office, despite the fact that he is left for a year's sabbatical, a mere two and a half weeks prior. It was rather sudden, she said. And if you ask me, something fishy is going on. It was so sudden, in fact, that Edmaster Rattal had to step in and take over all of his classes for him. Certainly unprofessional. But what do I know? Might have been a family emergency. All I know is he said he was heading north. And then she leads them into his office. Once there, Fenwick says that he's looking for a book to see if he might borrow it from the professor. Well, certainly I can help you look for it, but until I have his direct permission, I'm not sure I can let you leave with the book. I'm sorry, she says. Well, can we see if he has it nonetheless? Fenwick asks. I suppose that couldn't doubt. Let us look for it. And she begins to pull down the levitating bookcases that line the entirety of the room, a tall cylindrical chamber. And while she does so, Fenwick takes a look at Valtor's desk. He notes interesting symbology and formulaic study inside of a book on side of his desk. Memorizing some of the patterns, he later decides to write some of these down in his own book for further study. But more importantly, he sees a picture frame on the desk. The two objects of the picture, two very late middle-aged men, both with graying hair. The picture, having been enchanted, shows the two of them shaking hands and laughing joyously. But in a moment, Fenwick is sure that the second individual, not Vortal, looks directly at him and winks. Becoming angry, Fenwick decides he's had enough. 
He feigns some brief politeness, and Professor Calon leads them back out of the building. She asks if at some point he might be willing to teach her some more about his own enchantment magics, and offers a trade of information, as she is also willing to teach him more about the School of Transmutation, which he accepts. But from there, both Kethed and Fenwick decide to head back to Bramprox. Upon their arrival, they note an individual they have not seen before, but are aware of, standing outside of Bramprox III's. He knocks on the doorway and enters, declaring himself as Bernard, a Lanfany employee and representative, attends to Brambrock III's needs for all shipping inquiries, stating that there is a new ship incoming, one that had not been previously expected, and inquires whether Brambrock III might need any additional materials brought to his shop via the ship. Brambrock, recalling the conversation in which the individuals he is now hosting, expressed their concern with Lanfany and wanted to do some digging, eyes each of them warily, and tells Bernard, No, Bernard, I don't need anything. If it's all the same to you, I've got a lot of work to do. You should be on your way. And Bernard, seeming flustered, turns around and leaves the shop. But not before Greg sees the individuals coming back in and says, Oh, you going up to your rooms? And tensions flare, as the group specifically came here to hide and not have their whereabouts become revealed. Understanding what has just been leaked, both Fenwick and Kethed decide to interview this individual, following him outside, and begin asking questions and cornering him in a way that causes him to feel very uncomfortable as he informs them. Kethed, realizing this, reaches out his hand and places it on his shoulder, and channels his divinity to turn the aloneness of Bernard. Bernard, failing his wisdom saving throw, all of a sudden feels a strange connection with Kethed. I'm sorry. <sighs> Please pardon my rudeness. I... What is it that you need of me today? And the two of them then continue to ask all sorts of questions about Lanfany and the Snapdragon, learning some information, but not much. Mardigan, who has poised himself at the door to listen intently, decides to hide and sneak in the alleyway. While finishing listening to the conversation, he has plans of his own. The conversation goes well, and Bernard, having been told that there were supposedly slaves on that ship, asks if he might inquire of these two again to confirm their source and continue the Lanfany investigation into what would be a terrible crime against humanity. They agree and let him be on his way. Mardigan follows suit, and eventually, just before Bernard reaches the HQ for Lanfany, Mardigan pushes him into the alleyway. His face mask and hooded, he pulls a dagger and places it right to Bernard's lips, who in return feels terror. He then pulls out the pendant of the Agents of the Upside Down, in hopes of attempted intimidation. But much to his surprise, Bernard begins to laugh, stands up and says, All right, you got me. But Mardigan tries to press further. This angers Bernard and he tells him, How dare you? You should know your place. An agent like yourself? Giving me a Lanfany employee orders? That's rich. If you knew what's good for you, you would leave town before nightfall. I'll even give you a day's head start. Mardigan continues to try and intimidate, dropping multiple names, hoping that Bernard will drop information in his retorts. He is correct, and learns that Victoria is also associated with Lanfany, and even that Lady Arimet has plans for the city. Thoroughly confused, and certainly concerned, Mardigan ends up leaving, and makes his way back to Brombrox, where he informs the rest of the group what has happened, and they begin to piece all of it together. The group, heading into their guest bedroom to have this conversation, see Eros sitting on the steps, who has decided to stay away from all of this, and says, Wait a second, Rek has asked me for some privacy so we can change into his new clothes, something he had picked up from the Headless Hippogriff earlier that day. And eventually they all reach the door, and knock. Rek, are you... are you clothed? Yep, Rex says, and opens the door, wearing fashionable blue wizard's robes with a silver embossed smiley face in the center of the torso. This brings a smile to all of their wearied faces, and Rex, looking at Fenwick, says, Fenwick magic? Rex magic. And Fenwick smiles. You're right, Rex. You are. The group then heads into the room to have the conversation in full, revealing all of the information and beginning to plan for what is to come. Mardigan, having pieced together that the agents of the Upside Down are but mere pawns to Lanfany, reveals great concern, and notes that they have put Brambrock III in danger, likely meaning his shop, his livelihood, and even his life if they are not careful. Kethed seems quiet, and Eros begins hatching a scheme. I think I have a place for us to go, he says, but I'll have to go and clear it first. Mardigan pulls the bottle of bourbon out of his bag and hands it to Fenwick. Here you go. Fenwick sees it and says, My man, well done, and opens it, pouring himself a glass, and drinks deeply. As he does, the shadows of the room seem to grow fouler, darker, and more imminent, whereas any source of light seems far more blinding to him than what he normally would experience. Both Rek and Mardigan also choose to indulge, but they have different reactions, whereas the darkness itself seems to recede, and the shadows seem to pull away from them, granting them more of an affiliation with light. They offer to Kethed and Eros. 
both of whom declining, Kethed doing so viscerally. We should not waste resources like this. After Fenwick has identified all of the objects that Mardigan procured from the manor the night prior, as well as the bottle of bourbon, noting that the powers of this bourbon can either provide resistance from the damaging darkness of magics, or enhance the power of radiant magics, the group, still unsure of how to proceed, decide to lay in wait while Eros makes his way out. Howdy, everybody. I'm Spartan Bodhi, and if we had been primetime television, we would have been trending. Session 9 was some of the most intense D&D I think this group has had all campaign yet. And whereas, no, there was no combat encounter, there was certainly a lot of roleplay, exploration, and skill checks involved in this session. Whew, where do I even begin in starting to process all of this? You know, I don't think we can, because there's still a lot of questions to be answered as a result of this episode. But we've certainly discovered some interesting notes. The Agents of the Upside Down, the local thieves guild that seems to have quite a bit of sway in certain towns around here is but a pawn of Lanfany, and who will believe our small band of adventurers who have been framed for the murder of an NPC. And can we just talk about how sad it is that Merle died? I loved Merle Vare. He was fantastic. But Merle did what several bartenders do. If a drink is left completely untouched, sometimes you gotta pass the evening somehow. And Eros deciding to not drink the uh, poisoned ale given to him by this redheaded stranger meant that Merle was going to. And talk about a dramatic scene for our party. Which, interesting enough, they would not have witnessed had Mardigan not tried to sneak out of the window, and fallen, and then agreed to meet in the bar and be sang back to health by the bard, which absolutely was hilarious. Needless to say, this session was full of a lot of twists and turns, and we learned a couple of things about Fenwick, though probably not directly. <laughs> the Midnight Tears poison is a terrible poison, and Mardigan in the session learns that a poison like this often would cost around 1,500 gold pieces. When sharing this with the group, he ends up to discussing how terrifying that fact is alone, given the amount of resources necessary for an assassin to find themselves in possession of such a poison. Whatever Vicky, or Victoria, has up her sleeves, apparently her resources with Lanfany are great and numerous and that is concerning for many reasons. And her target is most definitely Eros. The heist was a very fun moment in this session, and granted, it did take a bit of time away from the rest of the party, but I feel like most of them were involved enough to actually witness Mardigan's first heist. Needless to say, the results were desirable. Having lifted quite a bit of coin of this Lanfany individual under the direct employment of Lady Arimet herself. Ah, now there's a name. We'll learn more about her in sessions to come, I'm sure. But for now, you should know that she's incredibly powerful. In other news, we got to meet Eloise Calon, and Professor Eloise is a lot of fun. Certainly her low wisdom showed, as she was quick to blurt out things that she probably would not have had she thought about them, and her gullibility made her very easy to sway with Fenwick's natural charm. This ended up being to his advantage so that he could look over Valtor's desk while he was in his office. And yes, I have made a special note for what all of those strange symbols and formulas mean, and later on that'll be something that Fenwick's player and I can actually work out for him to add to a spellbook. But more importantly, the picture on his desk tells us much more. Well, it will, once Fenwick starts telling his story. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The last thing I want to hone in on is the fact that we have a major reveal in Rex's backstory, which is that he was not born in the slightest, but instead was made by someone. Though that is also all of the information we have in that regard. And that happened within the first five minutes of play. So after a quick bathroom break early on in the session, the players already were extremely excited for the huge lore drop and backstory reveal that we had seen. Though granted, this was before Merle died of poisoning. God rest his soul. If you have a glass tonight, raise one for Merle. We'll certainly be missing him around these parts. But all that aside, I want to know what you thought of this episode. So, please, let me know in the comments below, how did you take this episode? What surprises stand out to you the most? And yes, I have a feeling that Session 10 will likely be the Crimson Coliseum Bronze League competition. That I'm really excited for. So for those who have been holding out for that arena competition, I know, me too. It's okay. We'll get there. This was worth it. Other than that, friends, thank you for stopping by. If you want to engage the community more, you should join our Discord. That link will be in the blah blah down below. But other than that, friend, I hope your Tuesday is going very well for you. Or whenever you're deciding to watch this video at. And if no one's told you today, you're a wonderful human being worthy of love. And lastly, adventure is calling. Are you listening? <laughs>